Dial the number at the bottom of your screen, and we will advance your investments. If you want enthusiastic, if you want, uh, if you want an enthusiastic duo like Travis and I, comment below, like the video, and make sure to subscribe. And we will give you the most exciting content you've ever seen. Roll that intro. <laughs> we should add up your intro. Hey everyone, my name is Ryan. And my name is Travis. And welcome to our channel where we talk about a lot of different stuff. Lately we've been into finances and talking about investment stuff. So uh, we have some advice for you today. We've been reading a book, Financial Freedom by Grant Sabatier. Uh, wonderful book, we've really enjoyed it and taking our time reading it too. I'm um, trying to elongate it a little bit just because <laughs> We've been taking our time to read this book. We've just really enjoyed it. Just wanted to spend some more time and uh, diving into some of the details of it. So um, today we're going to go over the seven step uh, of fast tracking the investment strategy. So Travis, you want to start it? Yes. First point is going to separate your short term and your long term investments. And this is kind of the precursor to all these other steps of just there's going to be some things that you have that are for the short term, which is a lot of times are emergencies. So an emergency fund is kind of one of the best things yeah. to put your money in. Um, I know I've got an emergency fund. As do I. Yeah. I believe you do too. And so that's stuff that you really don't need or are looking any gain or anything in the long term that you need out of it. So, um, but really kind of just liquidity, stuff that's easily accessible and, but you don't want that much in there. Um, a lot of, for emergency funds, they say six months is, is about what you're gonna want. Depending if you have access to other resources, you can cut that down if you wanna try and maximize other things. Mm -hmm. We can't really give you the best advice on that. Um, you really need to understand your circumstances and your scenarios to decide what's the best. But six months, you can do a lot in six months if you're able to cover your expenses. Um, but there are other ways you can have short-term investments like CDs or bonds, and, and we can go into that or we would direct you to the book for some of the best knowledge on that. But then your long-term goals. This is really stuff that the idea is you're buying and you're holding. You are, you're not really trying to touch this. You're trying to maximize what you're getting out of it. And really the rest of the steps are kind of attributed to the long-term investing. So that kind of sets up for where we go for the rest of the steps. Yeah. Then the step number two um, is just trying to figure out how much money you actually have to invest. So once you start saving some money for a little bit, uh, figure out your income, um, come up with some sort of a budget, just figure out what you're working with. And for me, it I kind of like to hit more of a number. I like to try to have about $500 a month to invest. Um, even if I'm not always directly investing it right now, I'm just putting it into a savings account. So. Uh, our emergency fund, for instance, is a little bit larger than what uh, we would like it to be, um, just because um, we've just been kind of putting some cash, trying to figure out where we want to invest that money, but that money's still going into the account, knowing I want to invest it. Um, but it took a while to figure out how much money we were, we were spending and, you know, between our house payment and a uh, grocery bill, and those are your two, housing, transportation, and food are gonna be your three big ones. So that's where uh, my wife and I have tried to spend a lot of our time figuring out what are we spending uh, and what amount can we spend on these things and still be comfortable, enjoy life, but have money to invest and think about our future as well. So that's kind of a number we've thought about, um, but first step or second step for this, uh, figure out how much you have to invest. Trev, do you have anything else on that? Yeah. Um the visibility into your finances is how you're gonna to find that. But, and I think that's a great, almost like a sub step, set, sub step to this is figuring how much you can increase your investments. And so one of the biggest things, if you're compounding your investments over time, if you're slowly increasing the amount you're investing, it's going to recompound that. And so um, we're not the biggest advocates of just setting this hard, fast budget because you're gonna wanna try and be aggressive and flexible with how you actually do invest. And so, yeah. 
but but really figuring out what you have left over but figuring out what you can sacrifice that you know that you don't really need or don't really want for something later on that you want more so a lot of this is about delayed gratification but i think what we have both come to find out is that we actually are more satisfied during this process mm. because we're actually actively contributing and achieving our goals and we can see the progress along the way because we are investing more it's a lot more fun to see your investment grow a lot more quicker because you're putting a lot more in it so mm -hmm. but you do need to actually really dig down and figure out what's there so yeah take some time to do that yeah and that leads us to step number three too and uh, we're going to determine your your target asset allocation and, and i'll let trav get into more of the details of what that means but um first is just trying to figure out why are you investing um something that we challenge each other on and both kind of come to a current conclusion and we always want to keep adapting and and we are open-minded and willing to change but uh, we want to enjoy the day-to-day -day life but but we also want to make sacrifices that we know will be pay off in the future by investing and sacrificing certain things um, but we don't want to sacrifice our happiness and just overall joy levels and uh, of today for like 10 years so we can enjoy retirement in the future so um, we just challenge you to think on your own and, and be open-minded, but figure out what you want. You know, if you have a family, uh, things are going to be a little bit different. If you're, you know, you have kids and you're trying to, your food budget's going to be higher. Um, your housing might be higher, you, kids expenses. So, um, your life's going to look a little bit different, um, than mine. Uh, might work just my wife and I, and, and we have more flexibility, um, uh, both with time. And then, um, so just try to figure out what you have, but try going a little bit about, what that means and, and uh, I guess how to determine your, your asset allocation. Yeah, a lot of it is the distance that you are from retirement because you still are trying, the goal is to, to build the lifestyle that you want for when you're not you know directly working too. Mm -hmm. And so Grant's kind of advice, and, and I think this is, is actually pretty spot on, is if you're 10 years out from investment, 100% in stocks because you're – what we've talked about earlier is you're picking broader market returns, which are going over the long term, going to give you better than average results. And so this isn't just 100% in Apple stock. Yeah. This isn't just, so that is more really on the edge of where you're kind of flipping a coin, hoping to get lucky. And that's not what we're about. And so, but then you can add bonds, which is essentially a company or the government is needing money it's a debt and they're offering a fixed interest rate at which they will pay you back the money at a later later date so it's a very very secure way to kind of have a little more of a, a you know kind of stashed resource and so that percentage that you can add that in and then cash is is the third part um and it's it's all a balance a lot of times it's what you're comfortable with um the best advice that i've been given about how much cash you should keep on hand is how much you feel comfortable with and so mm -hmm. it, it's different for everyone if you have more than 10 percent in cash it's the kind of idea is what are you really worried about and what are really your goals and it's probably going to cut in too much to those goals if you have too much cash because it's not growing you anything and you're actually losing money on it because of inflation so that's what we kind of said you that's why you have to separate your short-term and your long-term investing goals mm -hmm. so but there's kind of a you know it's, it's kind of a you know as you're getting closer to retirement you're kind of adding more bonds in there um even if you had it you know 90 percent stocks 10 percent bonds or 80 20 it, it's it, you're going to be fine you're going to get you know really solid results anything beyond that you're going to be in a much different investing style than we are we're not there yet i'm in a hundred percent stocks right now um some i do pick myself but then i also have a roth ira where all of it's just kind of in grouped index funds or, or mutual funds so that i'm trying to track better and broader market returns i was actually recently listening to grant sabatier's podcast um, which is um, the millennial money podcast and he actually had kevin o'leary on there uh, one of the, the host of Shark Tank, who's known for, you know, investing and making, having millions and millions of dollars and also being a part or running, you know, 
like 50 something company. So he's just well-known businessman, super smart, um, very reasonable. And he just, he's fun to listen to. And uh, he got known for like the person being the rude person on Shark Tank, but I really like it. And he actually talked about on the podcast that he doesn't have, the most he has in any investment is 5%. And once Hmm. even, he said, even like being invested in Apple, Amazon, and Tesla, once his money grew, because he because he was making money off of his investments, and once they went over 5%, he sells to make it always at 5%. So I just thought that was interesting that mm-hmm. he just is a huge believer in diversifying your portfolio uh, and you know changing things up when you need to. So that was good. Yep, and I've heard never have more than 10% if you are doing any like individual stock picking. Hmm. And the idea is if your stocks, I mean, cause you will pick and you will find great winners. And then the idea is if it's either, if it's winning too much, you either back off your contributions or you cut and sell some and then redistribute to your others, or you just try and up your other investments to match it. Um, it is kind of hard to think about selling your winners. I, I did hear this great quote of selling your winners and contributing to your losers is like cutting your flowers and watering the weeds. So definitely still like don't stunt your growth too. Um, you know, it, it's people who are disciplined though are great investors. And so it's, you know, you, you do have to figure out what you're comfortable with, but that's when if you, what would be problematic is if you see a winner doing so well and then you all of a sudden just put all of your contributions into that so if it's winning really well you don't have to typically sell it or to get back down to that level but don't over contribute to it to then over exacerbate then your actual winnings in that so yeah it's good so the fourth step is evaluating your current fees and trying to keep them as low as possible And this is what we talked about in our last video about really trying to maximize your contributions by minimizing how much you have to pay Mm -hmm. to contribute. And so sometimes we overlook this because it's so small and that's where they get you. And so um, Grant has a chart in his book because he wants people to see how much they're actually contributing. Um, Now is kind of the, I don't say like the golden age of investing, transaction fees are basically gone. Yeah, when it comes to fees, for sure. So that's beautiful right there. They used to charge you five to $7 per trade with a broker. Robinhood came out, went to $0. That's basically the standard now. So you should not be paying for any trade to make with a brokerage to try and actively invest in any sort of fund. So that's already one thing that you can kind of cut out. But then the funds that you invest in will have an expense. And so seeing that and keeping that low, that's another great thing. That's called the expense ratio. And so that's typically, you want that to be under a percent. It's basically a for fraction. For sure under a percent. Like Fidelity has, for the index fund that i investing in, uh, it's 0. 0.02. So, yep. I mean, it's as close, almost as close as you can get to zero. Yeah. And, uh, and it's almost nothing. And that's truly almost nothing. Yep. So that is very important. Um, he has a fantastic chart of the impact of if you're in a actively managed fund and that was 1.2% fee, and then you have a financial advisor for another percent, what 2.2% can do total to a person's investment over the course of their entire investing life. And so we'll kind of leave that in there just because it's a little more details. Um, it's But the percentage contributed to a 29% loss in your investment over the course of it wow. because all of that money was spent having someone else manage it where you could get similar returns and pay a fraction of the price because the compound investing works in the wrong way mm-hmm. when you're paying fees. So really important to actually understand it. It will take a little bit of time to do, but it's well worth it. It's really gonna pay off in the end. Yeah, that's good. And that kind of leads into step number five, which is uh, pick the right investments. And basically this is a combination of some of the previous things we talked about too, but um, one is just investing into an index fund, an overall stock market or an ETF where you're getting a, a diversified account that is 
uh, expanding your, your investment total overall across the whole stock market, basically. Um, so one, it's just less stress, and that's what I choose to do just because I don't want to day-to-day -day have to worry about it. I do, there are a few stocks that I'll individually purchase just because I kind of think it's fun and um, keeps me engaged a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoy that. But what about you for, what do you think about step number five? So picking the right investments, I just, it's so simple, but what they found is it's very difficult. And that's why what we'll keep saying and what a lot of this financial advice is saying is these ETFs or these funds that you're actually indexed funds is what they're called. Um, Grant shares a stat that 90% of people who actively pick their own investments in stocks are underperforming the market. And so I do pick stocks individually as a part of my investment. And I think it's really fun, but it's just so hard to really know. I still believe in picking good companies with good leaders who actually are, you know, they're not just trying to make a buck. That is a short term and that's more of a gamble. It's like, what's a long-term vision for a company? That's still important. So that is a part of it, but still, uh, an index fund basically means it's tracking a broader portion of the market. You can find index funds that only track one specific sector, or you can find them that track parts of the S&P 500, S&P 500 as a whole, the entire market. So you can get a lot of different parts of the bucket of all that investment. But the idea is, is the market is strong. It's going to return in the long term. And so just let it, let it do its thing. And then mm -hmm. add where it is fun and you have the money to extra beyond that and you're going to do well. So, and then also just a little bit of terminology, a mutual fund, that means it's actively managed. So that's typically where you're going to see fees. So watch out for those. Typically mutual funds are index funds. They're typically just hand-picked stocks to follow the broader market. Now an ETF is typically kind of set. It will be sometimes hand-picked, but it's not actively managed. And so an ETF stands for exchange traded fund. And so that's just basically, hey, here's a great broad return. It's not gonna charge a lot in fees, but it still will be an index fund where it tracks a broader portion of the market. And so those are really right now going to be some of the strongest and best bet for returns. Yeah. Step number six for our investment strategy is maximize your tax advantaged accounts. So. These are great. These are like 401ks, Roth IRAs, and 403bs for nonprofits. But the idea is, is that you're only taxed one way with your money. So you're not dual taxed, and that is good in, any, in all cases. So 401ks, in brief, I'll go over them quickly, is you're taxed when you withdraw the money. It actually is put into your account before all of your taxes are taken out on your income. So it actually lowers your taxable income as well. Then when you actually go to use it, when you're retiring, you pull it out, it's taxed one time at the income rate that you are when you withdraw it. Mm -hmm. So it's great to think about if you're gonna be lower income in a smaller tax bracket when you're older. Then a Roth IRA, you're taxed after all of your income has been, or sorry, you're, it's put in after all of your taxes are taken out of your income. So then when you withdraw it when you're retiring, then there's no taxes accounted for it. And that's typically gonna be if you're a higher income earner and you're gonna be in a larger tax bracket when you're actually withdrawing your money. So, and then another last one is an HSA. So these are great because it's called a health savings account. So if you have health expenses and you're actually using to pay out of that account, you're double tax advantage because you're not taxed when you put it in your account and you're not taxed when you're using those expenses on health expenses. So, and after it gets to a certain level in that account, then you can actually invest that into an active investment account too and get all the same gains that you can out of any of your other investments. So, because when you're in, and this moves kind of into our last point, when you're in normal investment accounts, you're taxed two times. You're taxed on your money, on your income, mm -hmm. and then when you buy and then by the time you sell that, that actual investment, any of those gains are then taxed. So anytime you can take taxes on a one way of the picture, 
is a good thing. And then the last step, number seven, is invest into taxable accounts. And this is basically a brokerage account of where you're investing directly into the stock market uh, and choosing which funds or stocks that you're purchasing. Um, so it is the money you're making, just your normal income from your, your job or your side hustle. Uh, it's taxed then, and then you're actually purchasing these stocks. Uh, and then depending on how they do at the end of the year, uh, and then also how long you hold them. If you hold them over a year, then you would end up getting taxed on, based on capital gains, uh, which is generally lower than actual income tax itself. Uh, but still, you're still getting taxed again. But the idea is um, once you max out your the traditional tax advantage accounts, this is when you start investing into a typical brokerage account. Um, but even though you get taxed a little bit more, there's a little bit more freedom and you can choose still choose what you want. Um, and then this is kind of the, with that extra income and really maybe how you're gonna reach financial freedom sooner just by uh, investing all that additional income. Mm -hmm. Yep, in a lot of two, um, the tax advantage accounts, you can have a lot of flexibility to invest in the same investments as a typical or traditional investment account. So check with your provider to see what you can actually invest in some are limited and so that's where if you do want to invest in something specific you will need to go out and actually have a taxable account but that's really where you're going to build your wealth and so um and doing that slowly and just doing that you know a little bit over time we're both big believer in it we've got money in the market and but we just kind of believe that if we just continually just over time and expect you know good gains that that we're gonna build our wealth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're just kind of chugging along for the journey and, and little by little. So that's where the fun stuff happens. That's where we get to invest in some individual stocks. Definitely, so. yeah. And this was our the one of the cool things we pulled out of Grant's book, uh, just the seven, his seven step fast track investment strategy that um, Trav liked and I thought it was good too. So we decided to make a video on it. And so credit goes to Grant Sabatier uh, for putting all his hard work into um, this book and all the, his life and experiences and conversations he's had with people. Um, so definitely thank you, Grant. And then we wanted to share with you guys as well and and tell you a little bit how we invest our money and how we don't invest it too and how we want to moving forward. So just kind of a fun uh, strategy and tips of investing. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, we're just really excited to expand our knowledge. We we want to share about what we're doing yeah. and because it excites us and we have so much fun learning and reading. And so let us know what you're reading. Let us know maybe what you got out of this book if you read it. And so we'd love to share that, love to continue to read. And so thanks again for joining us and we'll see you guys in the next one.